having me here today. It's a pleasure to talk with you all. And I am, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> so um, what I'm going to do today is talk with you about um, some things that you might already know. And what I'm hoping to do is to convince you to just do a little bit more <laughs> of what you might already be doing to work on making your workplace, your, your quality of life just a little bit better. Um, so today's session was, uh, I was asked to talk about de-stressing. Um, next slide, please. I think, do I have a clicker? Is this a clicker? Maybe I can do this. Great. So one thing we know is that some stress is necessary and healthy. Um, and in fact, some anxiety is, is just a part of life. If you're not anxious, you're not doing anything new. Um, and at, at low to moderate levels of stress, you're more focused, you're more alert, you're more tuned into what you're doing, um, you're less likely to make mistakes. Um, and past a certain point, you're actually more likely to make mistakes, you're less organized, um, and it will affect performance. So not all stress is bad, not all anxiety is bad. Uh, some of it is, is, is really necessary to do good work. And it's when you get to this other end, this high end of the continuum, that we start to see decreases in performance. And this is not advancing. There we go. Um, so when you are in a high stress job or environment, um, some of the things we see, and we're seeing a lot of this right now in a lot of different areas, um, burnout, um, sleep disruption, trouble sleeping, or full-blown insomnia. People get irritable, and then people don't like being around them. Uh, Longer-term health consequences, so we know that people in high-stress positions um, and, and jobs and careers are at higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, and then also there are a lot of mood and mental health risks. So there was a, a study that was done of over 13,000 working uh, attorneys and judges, and 46% um, had experienced depression at some point in their careers, and about 28% were currently experiencing depression, and 19% endorsed anxiety, and 11% endorsed suicidal ideation. So this is common. This is not one or two people off there in the corner. Um, this, is, this is a lot of your colleagues, your peers, people you encounter in your day-to-day -day life. Um, so we know that, that stress can have an impact um, on, on what you do and how you feel. And then, of course, there can be things like increased substance use to try to cope with it, lower levels of productivity. So there are real reasons both for your quality of life, for your, your life and your time and your experiences with your loved ones, and also your job, where just doing some things to deal with stress can make you um, a better lawyer, a better colleague, a better peer, a better partner, a better parent. So that's why I'm going to just talk with you today about some quick ways. These are just small things you can do um, in your day-to-day -day life, won't take too much time, that can help you uh, deal with stress. And then we'll talk about some things to do when that's not enough. So one thing many of us do is we get in our heads, we start to spin on what we're anxious about, we don't stay in the here and now, we might do this as we're going to sleep at night, we might do it during the work day. Um, so just taking two minutes, three minutes um, to focus in, and this is really just intended to get you out of your head and into the here and now. But just take a few minutes and look, find five things you can see, four things you can hear, and as you're doing this, you have to tune in a little bit more and think, well, what am I actually hearing? You can, you can, if you really tune into the here and now, you can see and hear a lot of, obviously, a lot of things. Three things you can feel. So this is sensory. You know, what can you, um, do you feel the weight of your body in the chair, that kind of thing. Two things you can smell. One thing you can taste. And the idea is just to get you out of your head for a minute, enough time to reset, and then you can kind of just get back to what you're doing. So when you're experiencing a high level of stress and anxiety, this is a nice brief thing you can do. Another thing is breathe better. So one thing that um, people don't always realize is that when you're under stress, you can start to um, breathe, into your, um, breathe into your chest instead of into your diaphragm. Those of you who are trained in any kind of, you know, in, in music and singing, things like that, you have an advantage because you know how to really breathe into your diaphragm. It's something a lot of us never really learn because we start out doing it. And then when we encounter stress, 
we start to breathe more into our chests. So if you put your hands on your, put one hand on your chest, one hand on your abdomen, and where does the, when you inhale, where does it go? Does your chest rise a lot? If it does, you're actually hyperventilating, low level hyperventilation. And that's one of the things that can actually kick off at really high levels if you've been doing it for a long time. You have an imbalance of, um, you know, you're not getting quite enough oxygen in and then your body starts to react, you do it more, and it can be a, a cycle. This is one of the things that actually happens when people are having panic attacks. So to correct this, it can be hard when you're at a really high level of anxiety. That's why just practicing and making it a habit to check your breathing on a regular basis can, can help. But to sort of reset, you exhale, get all the air out of your lungs. Um, and just so exhale everything, and then inhale slowly to a count of five. You can try this now if you'd like. One hand on your chest, one hand on your abdomen. You should see your, ab you, it, you shouldn't be forcing it, but actually you're, like you should be noticing that this part expands and this part isn't rising too much. So as you're doing it, just inhale to a count of five, six, four, whatever's comfortable for you. And then exhale slowly. So it's not deep breathing, it's slow breathing. So just breathe, um, work on just breathing in slowly, out slowly. And then if you really, if you notice, maybe you notice, wow, I think I do this a lot, to really get the, to really see what it's supposed to feel like if you lay down on your stomach, your body will naturally do this. So you can kind of get the sense of what that feels like and just practice it. And it can really help. So I used to be a very anxious flyer. And when we started getting turbulence, I would, um, you know, I'd start to get anxious and I'd notice my breathing would change. And once I started just tuning into my breathing and slowing it down, it made a huge difference. And I could just, you know, I could just bounce around in the sky and, and not, not get too anxious. So it, it can make a big difference in a very small amount of time. But sometimes you need some practice if you notice that you've been breathing into your chest. Another thing that can help is there are a lot of web-based tools and apps that are, um, that are designed to sort of help you in the moment. And since everybody's on their phone all the time, nobody will know what you're doing. So um, Mindfulness Coach is a, um, it's an app put out by the National Center for PTSD. And um, it's, it's really, it's a lovely app. There are a lot of different um, mindfulness exercises you can do. Uh, it's very brief. Um, you know, you, you can do very brief exercises and they don't collect any of your personal information. So it's very, it's, it's all confidential. It doesn't go anywhere. They don't sell your data. Um, there are also web-based um, interventions and sets of tools that you can use. Um, there are some that are paid products. There are some that are free. Um, there's one called COVID Coach that is um, intended to help people with the stress of COVID. Um, Pause a Moment is something that Stanford's going to be launching very soon um, that's all free and confidential and has a variety of different exercises, some of which are more kind of mindfulness and breathing, and some are things to help you when you're feeling overwhelmed and are a little bit more in depth. So another thing I want to encourage you all to do is make an investment. So maybe these things aren't quite enough. What kinds of things can you do that take, might take a little bit more time but can help you in, um, in the longer term? So one thing is, what's one thing that you can just delegate or outsource, either at work or at home, to make your life a little bit easier to just take one thing off your plate? Um, what's, what's one thing that it, it doesn't matter if you do it or somebody else does it, but it, it'd be a whole lot better if you didn't have to do it? Um, that might be some of the cleaning, some of the laundry. It might be something that you know that if you train somebody at work, they can do it. Make the investment to do it. What's one thing that you can do that stresses you out all the time, uh, or that you're to, to alleviate something that stresses you out all the time? So, are you, um, can you never find something because your office is a mess? You know, but you don't have time to clean your office and get organized, right? So that's one example. Or it might be things at home. It might be something outside of work. What's one thing that if you just put in a few hours, bite the bullet and do it, it's actually going to really improve your quality of life. And you just haven't done it because you don't think you have the time. So make an investment. Take the time. And then you'll see on the other side how much better it is. So put it on your schedule. Get it done. Another thing is schedule in breaks and exercise. So any kind of exercise, you know, take a walk. It doesn't have to be big. You don't have to get a Peloton, although you can. You can ride on your Peloton while you're on calls. I know people who do it. Um, walking calls, if you can, can be great. Um, but even if you don't think you need to do this, or even if you don't have time to do this, 
think about the message it sends to the folks that you work with. If they see you doing it, then it starts to sort of change the culture. It becomes a norm, and they might be able permission to do it. So think about it, even if you're not going to do it for yourself, but you think everybody else on your team should be doing it, taking breaks, taking care of themselves, exercising, especially if you're in a leadership position, they've got to see you doing it to think that it's OK. So do it for them, even if you don't do it for you. And you might notice some benefits for yourself. And then sleep. You all know sleep's really important. Sleep's really important. Um, sleep is, is implicated in things like depression and suicidal ideation. Things just get really bad when you're not sleeping well. So first of all, stop working in bed. If you wake up in the middle of the night and you want to pull out your phone and send some emails, get out of bed and do it. What happens is you start associating bed with things other than sleep. If you get up in the middle of the night and you're doing work, you're kind of wound up, that can be really difficult. Another thing you can do is write down what's on your mind, schedule time to do it in the morning, and then just get it off your plate. Get it, get it off your mind, get back and, you know. But get out of bed if you're going to work. Like if, you, if you're up and you, you know you're up, it's 4 a.m., you know you're not going to get back to sleep, get out of bed. Or just lay there and decide you're going to rest. But don't work in bed. Work somewhere else. This is a hard one. Screens off an hour or two before bed, or at the very least, adjust that blue light setting on your computer. But really, it's best to just take some time to kind of wind down. Watch caffeine and alcohol intake, especially in the four or five hours before bedtime. Um, you know, alcohol might help you go to sleep. It will not help you stay asleep. Um, you'll wake up in the middle of the night. And that can be really difficult. So, you know, everybody used to hear that you needed eight hours of sleep a night, and that would be lovely, and that would be great. The amount of sleep you need changes, you know, across the lifespan. Your kids need more. Um, but if you get six or more hours of sleep a night, you're doing, you're doing all right. Um, but if you're realizing one night you're not going to get your six hours, that's okay. Like, don't catastrophize about it. That's going to keep you awake. Just chalk it up. It's a bad night. Jot down what's on your mind. Get out of bed. Read for a while. Find something boring to read. Um, and then uh, try to get back to sleep. Uh, don't nap for two or three hours during the day. Who has time for that? I know. But if you do that, you're not going to sleep that night. So limit your nap to like the 20-minute power nap. Um, those can be lovely. Um, there are sleep podcasts. So you can, you can do a sleep podcast. Some of them are just designed to be very dull. Some of them have music or a meditation that you can turn on. Um, you can put it on and listen to it, and it might help you fall asleep because it gets your mind off whatever else. And then if you're really having trouble with sleep, the most effective treatment out there, the, the frontline treatment, is not sleeping pills. It's actually cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And um, this is a really brief, it's maybe four sessions, four or five sessions. Um, it's very effective. And they basically, they, they do a few different things. They, they kind of help you retrain yourself around sleep. And they help you. Um, you look at the kinds of patterns and things you're doing that are getting in the way of getting good sleep, and they basically help you retrain. But you can also do this if you don't think you have time to get to therapy, if you can't find somebody who's been trained in cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, or CBTI as it's called. There are also apps. There are some that are on the market. There are some that are free. Um, but if they have the cognitive behavioral principles, um, they, they tend to be pretty effective. So you can do it, you can do it on an app. or you can do it in person if you find somebody who's been trained. And then finally, for some people, you might find that you need some support. And there are a lot of ways to do this. So you probably know about the Lawyer Assistance Program and other resources that are available. They are confidential. Um, and they are things that you can take advantage of. They have individual and, and group options for people. Um, but there's also psychotherapy. And psychotherapy doesn't have to be 10 years laying on a couch free associating like you see in the Woody Allen movies and things. They can be, it can be brief and short term and problem focused. Um, there, are, there are some treatments that are designed to be that way. And you can notice, even for things like depression um, or anxiety disorders, within you know, eight sessions, you can see a big difference. And some, you can start seeing a difference even in four or five. So, um, finding somebody that does more short-term, um, often they're cognitive behavioral or kind of mindfulness-based. Um, so looking for therapists that, that do short-term therapies if that's what you want. Um, and then there are also therapists too who do longer-term, depending on what your needs are. 
Um, but there are also more and more for people who don't have time. And, and let's face it, therapy is an investment. If you have to drive to somebody's office, then you're taking close to an hour if you live in the Bay Area to get to a, uh, a therapist, park, do your therapy, take another hour to get back. Who has that kind of time? Telehealth is wonderful for that. It's a different experience, but there, there have been studies to show that it's just as good, both in terms of your relationship with your therapist, but also um, the outcomes that you can get. So telehealth can be great, but there's also asynchronous messaging-based therapy that's starting to happen. Um, so there are companies that, that have uh, licensed therapists and you can, you can message back and forth with them and you can do it any time and they usually are set up so they respond maybe once or twice a day. And some people find that very helpful and there's some data um, showing that that can help too. So there are a lot of ways to get support and help and also peer support is really wonderful. If you find a group of you know, uh, friends or, or people that you can kind of get together regularly with and you know that you can kind of trust them and be open, peer support can be fantastic. So you know, maybe there are groups of people that are struggling with some of the same types of stressors that you are. Um, and you know, just having that support so that you don't feel alone, people can help with practical solutions, can be really also wonderful ways that don't involve um, actually seeking out mental health treatment. So um, we all experience stress and anxiety. We're all going to have ups and downs in our mood. But there are things you can do, and just making that small investment can make a very big difference in your quality of life, your quality of work and in how you relate to the people you work with. So um, try some of these things out, and um, thank you all for the work you do. It's important, and, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today.